Welcome back. And Mark Miller is here live and in person. Well, live with me. This is going to be uploaded later. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Wes. I've always enjoyed the podcast, you know, so like it uh, feels funny seeing you in real life. You know? Well, thank you. I'm, this is like a bucket list item for me. I'm shocked that you're here, but I'm excited to talk about all this news. Like you were uh, coming out with news left and right of the last few days, and you promised something very big today. Nightclub. We saw the cover from Capullo look very interesting. Now we have an artist, Juan and Ramirez, but more exciting, we have a price on it. Some people have had uh, two ninety nine comic books lately. That's been very abnormal. You're going down to one ninety nine. All my life, things go up in price, right? And it's the, you know you kind of grow. It. I remember when I was a kid, I used to have enough allowance, you know, like pocket money we call it, um, to buy five comics. I used to be able to buy five comics every week with my allowance. And then I remember they upped the price, and I could only buy four. And it was like I wasn't magically getting any more money. I had to lose a comic, you know. So it's always sad, isn't it, when comics go up in price? And when I saw them hitting two ninety nine, I was like, oh, you know, you, you read them pretty fast. Two ninety nine's a lot. Three ninety nine, oh my god, you know. And then I'm seeing them four ninety nine and five. And I'm like, right, hang on. And I just thought, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to see what happens. We might fail, you know. We, this might lose money. Um, we're, we're dealing with really good talent and everything on the thing, you know. So you have to pay them better than Marvel and DC pay them, you know. So the overheads are going to be pretty high. But I just think, you know what? Everybody loves a bargain, don't they? Everybody loves getting something a little. I'm a, I'm a Scotsman, right? I like a, I like a good bargain. And to get a comic for uh, for one ninety nine, it's going to be awesome. And it's our most commercial launch of the year, so I thought this is the one to do it on. Just see what happens. Well, obviously, you're you're going to be publishing through Image Comics, you know, with the actual comic books and. There's been a direct correlation to Spawn going down to two ninety nine and the increased interest in the title. You know, uh, it kind of plateaued there for a while, then they dropped the price. People got close to you know Spawn three hundred, and the yeah. interest really picked up. And I think one of the reasons it stayed up there is probably the best selling indie comic out there today because it, it does feel like a bargain at two ninety nine when you can go over to DC Comics and get the Joker ongoing series. You know, it's six dollars or Batman's five dollars. Yeah. Kind of all their big characters are five five dollars now. So I think people are going to notice that it's like half price compared to, you know, yeah. all the pure comic books out there. The only other comics that I know that are new that are two bucks are, uh, I think, alternative comics. Right, right. Because because I, I, I think companies forget not everyone gets the books for free. Like, see, if you work in a comic book company, are your friends with the comic book guys? Are you used to work there? You get your comics for free. Like, I still get big boxes sent to me with all these free books. So I hardly ever have to pay for anything. I remember where it was like, they have no money at all, you know, and really want to get some comics, you know. So some people, you know, it's an expensive hobby, you know. So I think Todd, Todd's a brilliant businessman. And I think Todd dropping the price at $2.99 um, was genius. It was, it was a really great move. And I thought about two ninety nine, but I thought I'm going to go even crazier and do half price. And it, and the books are actually slightly bigger than normal books, you know, they're 20, 22 pages. Mine's always set about 25, 26, you know. So um, so this is a pretty meaty bargain for one ninety nine. I'm 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 really excited about it. Uh, people people have responded really well to it, which is great. And I, do what I really hope happens. I hope it works brilliantly. Right, you have to sell twice as many books, you know, to make the same money. But see if it works and you sell three times as many books or something. Wouldn't it be awesome if Marvel and DC were like, yeah, we should maybe try this with Spider Man and Batman as well, you know? And and imagine you could go into a comic store with ten bucks and come out with five comics. Yeah, because it's had bigger effects than just, you know, on the American comic book industry. Obviously, you're in Scotland. I'm in the Philippines. I've heard from comic book readers in South America. Like yeah. here in, in the Philippines, there's no distribution from Marvel and DC or even Image Comics here. Like they have to have a like a like a different deal where they're sent over by airplane. And yeah. the shipping cost is a lot. So right okay. on top, it, it's 20 percent more for cover price. And then, you know, I don't live in Manila, so I have to pay for shipping. Oh, right, so, right. You know, this is a pretty poor country. It ends up being really expensive. South America is a poor, poor place. A lot of those places it ends up becoming like, um, yeah. you know, prohibitively expensive. You almost yeah. have to be kind of rich to to enjoy the hobby outside of the U.S. Well, the most amazing thing I noticed was price. Excuse me, price inflation on comics um, over the decades uh, was that from 1935, when you know DC Comics was uh, first publishing his National Comics, um, they were ten cents. And they stayed that till about 1970 or something, you know, like for about 40, 35, 40 years, they stayed at 10 cents. And whenever they went up to 12 cents, I've, I, I found this in an old comic that I found, they issued an apology to readers 
they were like, I mean, they held the same price for 35 years and they were like, we're so sorry, we're having to increase this by, by two cents. And I kind of love that, but you see it kind of going 199, 299. And I understand why, because page rates have gone up a lot. You know, like when I started in comics, um, you know, it was not untypical for Marvel and DC to be paying two, three hundred dollars a page. Now it's not unusual to get fifteen hundred dollars a page. You know, like if you're a big, big name artist, um, and you know that they don't sell the way they sold in the eighties or whatever. You know, so they have to jack up the price. They cover the, the rates. So I just, but I'm going to take this risk and see what happens. Like I love a gamble. I love a kind of just a crazy stunt and just see what happens. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Like comics is supposed to be kind of inventive, isn't it? Well, you've certainly been a bit of over the years. I, I like you putting your kind of your mouth, your money where your mouth is. Like, hey, comic books are too expensive. What can I do about it? You're, you're one of the bigger uh, deals in comic books. Let's see if we can get it down to, to two dollars. And the project itself, Nightclub, is is pretty cool. You know, it's vampires. What if they didn't want to eat people? What if they wanted to be superheroes? It looked like it looks like there might be a little bit of luchador flair on there with the mask that Capullo put on him. You know, Juan, Juan and Ramirez is a good artist. I've been reading his Genis Vell, uh, Captain Marvel. I think it came out last week. He's done some other yeah. work. So you didn't skip out on the artist. He's awesome. I mean, I, I love comic art. Like, comic art is my favorite thing. I love seeing the emails coming in with an attachment. I'm like, that's some comic art. This is going to be great. You know? And, you know, he's he's fantastic. I, I fell in love with this stuff as soon as I saw it. He was doing some Shang-Chi last year and I was like this is this guy's great I have to get him on something and and I'd been looking for an artist for this for a little while I created it as a show in house at Netflix like my full time job my day job is an exec at Netflix and a lot of people don't understand a lot of people think we've got a first look deal or something like this what we did is in 2017 we sold our company to Netflix the way Marvel was sold to Disney you know um, so they own it outright if I get hit by a bus tomorrow that carries on, you know, they, they own everything. Um, but part of um, our arrangement was they said to me, uh, look, we all got on really well. We're having a good time and everything just to, as we were doing our negotiations. They said, do you want to come on staff and uh, actually finish off all these projects that you're doing? So I'd started things like Chrononauts and they were like, could you do Chrononauts 2 and 3 so that we have sequels to do and everything, you know? Um, and they also wanted me to create new stuff as well, which is like Magic Order and all that kind of thing. So it's not the arrangement I had um, you know, with my, my Miller World stuff the, when I was a private company. Um, so what is I create these things as shows now, and maybe half of them, two-thirds of the things I create in-house as shows or movies, we also do as a comic book too. So so that's what Nightclub is. And it was an idea I had as a kid, actually, because what I realized when I was a kid is that superheroes and vampires are kind of similar. You know, it's a, they've got powers, they've got a kind of list of abilities that's a kind of very well-defined bunch of powers, the way Superman has or the Flash has or something. But they also have weaknesses, you know, they get sunlight, guard like it, that's their kryptonite. And I was this kid, as a kid, I always thought, yeah, if I was bitten, I wouldn't go and kill people, I'd become a superhero. I'd put on a mask and I'd become a superhero. So obviously you you re you grew up reading comic books, so you end up with this great deal at Netflix. You don't have to do the comic books, but are you still doing them just because you love comic books that much that you didn't want to give it up? Yeah, I, I do it for free. I literally do it for free. You know, like my, my salary at Netflix is as an executive, it's not to write comics, you know. So what they wanted me to do was to write the what's called a scriptment, you know, like a really detailed um outline, you know, maybe twenty pages long or something for for the sequels to my stuff or any new things that I create and work on uh, with teams of guys to do character bibles and everything. Um, I was like, I just love doing comics. I said, do you mind if I take some time and go off and do some comics as well, like turn some of the stuff into comics? And they were like, yeah, but you don't need to. It's a lot of work. And I was like, I, I, I would do this as my hobby. It's, it's great. And they actually said to me, the one condition is you get the best artists you can possibly get because we want the brand to remain high quality because the Mellow World stuff is always great artists. Um, and I was like, that suits me. You know, so they gave me a great budget and says, just go and have some fun. And they make their money back and they're even in profit, actually. You know, so we, we pay crazy money to these artists, you know, really big artists that we, you know, we steal from Marvel and DC, which is great fun, you know. Uh, and, uh, and it's just been, you know, there's no downside. It's just been pure fun the whole time I've been there. Speaking of great artists and kind of poaching from Marvel and DC, obviously you had a couple of big announcements over the last uh, 24, 48 hours. First up, we'll, we'll talk about Jorge Jimenez coming on board, Miller World. Also the Batman artist, is he's going to be doing this Nemesis Reloaded. Last time we saw Nemesis, I think he died, but it certainly was hinted at that the, a new version of Nemesis could be coming back. I don't think you could have found a better artist for this project. You know, there are some Batman-like tendencies to Nemesis, but, you know, mm -hmm. 
being a little bit more evil or on the evil side. So that's got to be really exciting. I know a lot of people are waiting for something like this. Well, it's funny. I, it was a little four-issue miniseries I did in 2010. I think it was March 2010, thereabouts. And, like, it was really weird. It just really caught on. And it was it sold tons of copies, you know. It sold a lot of books and it sold a lot of trades. And any time I do a signing, there's always 10 people show up in Emesis, even oh, a decade on. It's, it's really interesting. So I've always planned to do more of it. And, you know, we're planning on doing something with the film rights as well. You know, we're getting them back hopefully quite soon because they've been at Warner. They were at Fox. Um, for about seven or eight years or something, and then uh, they went to Warner Brothers where they've been for a little while. Um, so it's a really, it's a property we're all really interested in and really excited about. And as soon as we get it back, we'll do something live action with it. Um, but I just couldn't wait to get back into the character, and I had a ball. And I, my philosophy is, if you have to wait eighteen months or thirty six months to get the right guy, wait. And I have done that with Horby. Like he and I started talking a couple of years back, and uh, I'm. I'm blown away by what he's doing. I've wanted to work with this guy for a while. I saw his Superman covers and things, and I was like, totally fell in love with his artwork. And I, did, I wrote him fan mail. I would actually write him fan mail and say, look, I'm just really enjoying what you're doing. If you've ever got a, a moment, we should do something together. And he's just been a total treat. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, he kind of uh, comes onto the scene doing Super Sons and some super made work. And he does great work with like kid characters. He makes them look very innocent, but he's really good with the stylization. Then he gets on to Batman. And you see, maybe there's a little bit more um, edginess to his art when he needs to be, which obviously fits more into your line of style uh, as far as comic book writing, where it's going to be a little bit more gore and uh, yeah. maybe some some crazy brutality happening. Yeah, uh, definitely. And he, he works great like that. You know, he fits into that whole sort of Tom McFarlane kind of vibe and everything as well. And Greg Capullo, you know, the, the stuff you'd expect from Batman. But, you know, I like to mix it up with my stuff too. You know, I'll try and do really sweet things occasionally. I'll try and surprise you so you never know what, what's coming next. And he blew me away by how easily he adapted, you know, to go from Superman to Batman as seamlessly as he did. And I've always thought there's kind of some people who are like great Batman writers, but they're not so great at doing Superman, are great Superman writers, and they're not great at doing Batman. And I think that applies to artwork as well. I think Superman works really well with a photorealist generally, you know. A cartoonist doesn't work as well on Superman. Batman needs a cartoony quality because it's set in real life and you need to do cool things with his cape and everything, you know. Photorealism doesn't work so well in Batman. Um, so not many artists can do both, but I think Horgy, he's amazing, he can. Yeah, it's not fair that he looks like he's a model, though, you know what I mean? Ah, he's going to age terribly. He'll age in 10 years' time. <laughs> <if he falls. laughs> we won't have it anymore in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so the other big announcement was Pepe the Raz coming over from Marvel Comics. Most people know him from uh, House of X, Powers of 10. My personal favorite is the Kanan Jarrus, Jarrus series with uh, Greg Wiseman you know, in the Star Wars universe. That's yeah. another big get. Big game we don't know as much about, but the rumors are, and I, I did see it from the Miller World official uh, Twitter, is that it might be some type of crossover between all of your properties. It's something we're thinking about, you know. Like when I say we're thinking about, I know what we're doing, but like uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be uh, sort of coy about it. But but uh, this is, I think this is the most commercial thing we've ever done, right? So it had to be the most commercial artist in the industry. You know, it had to be somebody that could pull this off. And our franchises, I mean, what is there, what, 25 of them now or something? You know, by the time you include Kick-Ass Kingsman, all that sort of stuff. And what's really cool is by the time this comes out, you know, you're gearing up the Magic Order TV show will be starting to get promoted. And, you know, you've you've got um, Starlight getting made over at 20th Century and everything. So even the ones that the public aren't that aware of yet, you know, they all seem like a big deal. So having them all coming together in this one book, by the time the trade's collected, half of these things are going to be very publicly mainstream known, you know, which is which is really exciting too. So um, I, I, it was great. But again, it was one of those things I waited until I had an artist that could handle something of this scope because, you know, you've got to be able to draw Kick-Ass and Magic Order and Jupiter's Legacy, whatever you, like all these characters. Mm -hmm. Not every artist can pull that off, but Pepe's been doing team books for a little while. You know, he does such a great job on X-Men. And again, there, there was, it sounds awful, right? The childish part of me is like, it's pretty cool stealing Marvel's biggest artist as well as DC's <laughs> biggest artist, you know? So I feel I feel like a, a super villain, you know? I'm just coming in and snatching these guys in the night. Yeah, that's a pretty big get. I know you've worked with Eric Canetti in the past, and I've talked to him, you know, on the channel and behind the scenes, and yeah. he's always blown away by Pepe the Raz. He, he talks about he's the, like one of the few artists in the industry that no matter what you give him, you can give him, you know, Superman, Batman. You yeah. give him Aquaman. He's yeah. gonna make it look better than you initially anticipated. 
because he's such a, a, a quality artist. He calls him a hyper carry artist as far as comic books. But I saw that name, I was like, I could see this working because he's so used to integrating different characters from different kind of franchises. Obviously, Marvel is connected, but yeah. bringing them together and making them all look cool, that's yeah. kind of the hard part, right? You don't want anyone not looking good in the background. Exactly. And and what strengths you bring to some characters, you know, could be your weakness and something else. You might be not great at drawing old people or kids or whatever, you know. Pepe is the real deal, you know. And it's funny, Eric is also the real deal, by the way. Eric Canetti is amazing. I've I've loved Eric for years, uh, 20, 20 plus years. You know, I, I saw the stuff he was doing at, at Marvel that was like 10 years ahead of its time. You know, like the Marvel fans were reacting against them actually at that time because it was kind of a, it was outside the established house style. But I feel the world has caught up with Eric Canetti now and they appreciate him for how brilliant he is. And I was lucky enough to work with him on Chrononauts 2 and it was just, I mean, every page that came in, I was just like, forwarding it to my friends you know i've got a little group of about 25 artists friends comic book artists friends and anytime i get a page and it must drive them crazy like i send it out to all of them and then you know we all buzz about it you know so gg cavanago who's drawing um the magic order volume three which is out just now issue, issue one just came out like they're all in love with him you know so anytime three pages appear as a pdf i get them all out to all my friends you know frank quietly and everybody and olivia coipel and they all come back buzzing about it, you know, and it's kind of like a little virtual studio we've got, you know, that we all hype each other up and get each other excited about the artwork. It's great. Yeah, it makes sense with Eric. You know, he kind of came up in the, you know, with Jim Lee and Wildstorm and all that, where he's like in this bullpen with all the up and coming artists and Dustin Wynn mm -hmm. sitting next to him and everything. And yeah. you just have to raise your game up or you're going to be left behind. And he certainly ended up uh, becoming just a fabulous artist. You mentioned the Spider-Man thing. I think that's where he got it, got the most flack about it. But, you know, I think he came out the other end of just a better artist anyway. Absolutely. You know, and, and I don't think it was the fault with him at all. I think it was just people weren't ready for something that cool. You know, was, uh, <laughs> but I think now people appreciate him, I think, and especially his color stuff. I mean, I don't know if you ever do this, but what I do with comic art sometimes is when I'm in the middle of work, I've got a little 10 minute tea break, I go and make a cup of tea and I just go on somebody's timeline and I scroll down all their media. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I avoid the guys that are talking about politics or something that's like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't care, you know, but, but, you know, as you scroll down and you see just some awesome artwork, you know, when somebody's been posting some works in progress and all that kind of stuff. And it's a total treat. It's one of the great joys of comics is appreciating comic art, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's nice being friends with Eric. You, you know, every once in a while he throws me a bone and he'll send me some of his pictures on the, the stuff he's working on. Because, you know, he's like, he's already five volumes into this book that he's doing on crowdfunding. So yeah. he gives me a teaser every once in a while. I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy that Marvel and DC let him get away kind of over to video games and all that kind of stuff. But I guess in the end, you can't can't blame him, but he did come back kind of like you, and he's doing it for the love of gobble books, and that's what's really important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird, though, because in the old days, you know, people thought Marvel and DC was you know, the ultimate aspiration, and I, I include myself in that. You know, for, for me, I, I didn't even particularly want to go to Marvel. I was a DC guy. Like, I, I, I only wanted to work in DC. Um, but then you realize there's this whole other world out there, like create your own comics or, or crowdfunding comics and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and I've got pals who do crowdfunding who make way more than the guys doing Batman and X-Men, you know, for, from doing it too. So you can do something that's a passion project and pay your bills, which is amazing. I mean, in a lot of ways, people sort of say, oh, we're in a bad time working in comics and everything, but think about it, right? I mean, this is why I'm, I'm always amazed at where we are right now. Even in the 90s, you could only do superhero comics. If you did, if you even tried sci-fi or horror, rarely sold, you know, you, if you didn't do superheroes, you were not making a living, you know? Now you can do comics literally about anything, like anything, and you, you'll find an audience. If it's good, you, you'll, you'll find a way out. You can download comics anywhere in the world onto your phone. You know, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's absolutely amazing. Every bookstore has a graphic novel section and they're advertising their comics in these $300 million movies, $200 million movies out there. It's such a great time, you know, like, but strangely, I'm not reading as many American comics as I used to, you know, like uh, I'm finding them a bit less interesting than I did. But um, but there's a great there's a great platform for new creators, I think, to come in and revolutionize the industry. I, I feel as if it's coming. I, I've smelt it in the air for a couple of years, like COVID slowed it down, but there's a whole new generation of people desperately wanting them, I'm sure. And as a reader, I desperately want them to. Yeah, it's crazy. There's more new comic readers today than there's ever been. You know, comic books are actually growing 
you know, it's, it's yeah. kind of up to uh, American superhero comics to kind of keep up and find their niche in there. It yeah. feels like it's going a lot more to like, you know, graphic novels as far as uh, mainstream comics. But there are so many avenues now. You don't just have to crowdfund. You could go and do a comic series on Instagram. Yeah. And find a following yeah. there and Instagram will pay you. You can yeah. go out there and do one on Facebook now. They've got a program where you can make up to, I think, $30,000 a month. If you have enough interaction and people with you, uh, you know, there's just so many ways to do it, webtoons and stuff. And yeah. there's really, um, yeah, there's no inhibitors, really. If you want to go out and make a comic book, there's no one to tell you no anymore. Absolutely. You know, and, and there, there used to be gatekeepers, you know, like Marvel and DC. If you didn't work there, it was quite hard to make a living. When I was a teenager, that was like the only games in town in the American market. You know, really, I mean, there was smaller companies, but you weren't always guaranteed to get paid. And yeah, they were pretty hard to break into as well. They seemed very far away. Marvel and DC were actively kind of looking for submissions, you know, so that seemed a good place to go for. But now it's amazing. Like you say, you can do comics literally about anything you want. And here's what I'd say to everybody as well is just do it. Just try it, you know, like... Like if you're bored and all, you know, if you're not enjoying what you're currently reading, see that. This is what I always think, you know. See that as inspiration to go and do something better. You know, go and actually give it a try, and you you might be the next Alan Moore. You know, you might be absolutely brilliant. I'm sure there's some geniuses out there who are totally untapped. Oh yeah, there's there's so many creative ways to do it, and I like what what uh, you've done. You seem to get the best effort out of your artists. You know, just thinking about King of Spies recently with Matteo Scalera, who's who's a great artist. So I don't want to undersell him. But that felt like the best work of his career. Remember when we sold the company to Netflix, though, that was the end of um, the creator and comic side of things. You know, so everything post the company sale in 2017, it's all owned by Netflix. So neither me nor the artists own it. So what happens is I, like King of Spies, I created as a franchise in-house at Netflix. And then we had a design Bible and then we went to artists. Same thing with Magic Order too, you know. But what, what I said to Netflix is if, if you can't give artists like ownership or, or, or me ownership, you have to give them a big page rate, you know. So mm -hmm. that's that's the compensation instead. The guys are really well paid. But I think, to be honest, I think just enjoying your job is the big thing. Like, um, like Matteo was having a ball doing that stuff. And every page I'm trying to think of something interesting for him to draw, you know. You don't want to sit and draw talking heads. A comic book should be visceral and moving fast all the time, shouldn't it? There's a little bit too much talking heads, but yeah, just think about King of Spies. You know, I've read it this year. I was blown away by the artwork that he did. Uh, so many cool layouts, and it's just um, it's just a living, breathing story. There's so much action and uh, you know gore. There's hilarious moments in there, and uh, just really great work. Hopefully, we get to see that one, you know, come on the Netflix. Yeah, well, our plan is, I mean, obviously, Piers Brosnan's the, the, the man we want for it, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, my inspiration for it actually was, I remember hearing this interview with um, Tarantino, where he said that he met Brosnan to, to do Casino Royale years back, and they were they were talking about doing a big last great James Bond film for, for Brosnan, and I always felt that Brosnan was cheated out of that, like, uh, it's a shame he didn't get to do his last Bonds, uh, and, you know, that last one was such a, a rubbish one to end on, die another day for him. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great to get Brosnan back and just do a great big spy, old school, fun spy movie with him, you know? Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, it definitely felt like an old man Bond kind of story. I really enjoyed yeah. that one. Obviously, you'd have some knowledge about some old man stories. You said earlier that you're a DC Comics fan. You know, in yeah. modern DC fans, when they come into DC, you think it's, you know, Batman comics. Batman yeah. is the big character. He's the focal point of the DC universe. Yeah. But back in the day, Superman was the focal point of the DC Comics universe. He would have been the big introduction. I know a lot of people probably know you, obviously, from Superman Red Sun. You had the project with Grant Morrison, Mark Wade, and Tom Payer that was going to do some radical changes to Superman. It didn't quite happen. Yeah. But you also did all-ages Superman comic books where you're yeah. kind of honoring the tradition, the, the basic level of what Superman is and can be, especially to kids. Where did this love for Superman come from? I can't remember not being into Superman almost. You know, like I was maybe four. I, 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 because it's so long ago, it's kind of hazy, but maybe four or five, uh, there was a Superman cartoon on in Wednesdays. And it was, I think, the ones Americans had maybe 10 years previous. And I remember just like being mesmerized by this cartoon as a kid and just loving it. And then finding out there was comic books of it too. And I remember I had a Batman comic. Somebody bought me a Batman comic that had an ad in the back of it for a Superman comic. And I was like, that's the guy from the TV show, you know? And my wife got me the most amazing Christmas present about five years ago. She tracked down the original art for the, com the first Superman comic I ever saw, the cover. 
She tracked it down. And it's an amazing Bob Oxner, a picture of Superman with a kid on his back flying past the Statue of Liberty. It's from 1975 or thereabouts, you know, and it's up in my office now. Um, but I, as soon as I saw it, I thought, this is my thing, you know, and <laughs> Superman the movie was like a papal visit for me, you know, it was like, it was, uh, I mean, that was like the most important night of my life. I was so excited going to see Superman when I was eight. I, I vomited in the street. Like my mom, <laughs> my mom and dad were standing with me. And my mom said to me, are you feeling too sick to go in? And I was like, no, I'm being sick because I'm so happy. I'm so excited, you know? And like, yeah, I just couldn't wait, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy when you think about uh, so many different takes on the character. Obviously, Red Sun is an Elseworlds kind of different take. Your all ages yeah. story would have been something a bit more traditional. Uh, Mark Wade has done something very traditional and very, some very not traditional, like Kingdom Come. It seems like a lot of creators nowadays think that Superman's not like a malleable character, that maybe he's outlived his usefulness in the comic universe. And I think they're just being uncreative when they're thinking about what Superman, what he means, and the way that you can do great Superman stories today. I, I think so. I think you're only limited by your imagination. You know, like if, if you can't write a good Superman story, it's, it's your fault it's not Superman's. <laughs> you know, so, so I, I, <laughs> but I think like, I mean, that's my dream. I mean, I, I think I said to you in an email, my, my family and I were in Greece last week and I was swimming in the sea and I was just thinking, I, I, these ideas can't help come to you. You know, I mean, even though I'm working at a studio, like, I come up with a great idea for a six part Superman event, you know? And I was like, damn. And I was swimming about and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I came back and I lay in the lounger and I, the whole thing came to me, like the beginning, the middle and the end, the twist, everything. And I said to my wife, I need to run back to the room and write this down. This is like too good. And she was like, you're mad. She was like, <laughs> <laughs> you're, ne you're never going to have time to do this. You know, you don't work at DC. And I was like, at some point, I might write a story, and I ran back to the room and just scribbled it all down. So it's, it's all there. But I have reams of things like this, like Justice League stories or Green Lantern stories and everything that I would love to do. And my dream at some point, you know, years down the line, is imagine Frank Quitely, you know, doing Green Lantern, you know, a great six part Green Lantern story. Brian Hitch and I or something doing Superman, you know, Olivia Coypel and I doing Justice League. So these things tickle me so much as a fan that I thought I never want to forget a good idea. So I jot them all down. I keep them all in folders and pads all over all over the house. Did you get to read uh, Brian Hitch's Hawkman series with Robert Venditti? No, I, Brian sent me a lot of the art, though. And, and, and Robert Venditti, I've heard, is great. You know, so I, it's a, something I'm going to pick up. It was a few years back, but it looked great. And I love Hawkman. And it's so rare to see Hawkman drawn really well. And, and like Joe Kubert, like raised the bar right at the beginning, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, his stuff was just so amazing. Um, but uh, Brian's, you know, the best modern Hawkman artist, obviously, that there is, you know? Yeah, you could just tell he was, like, born to to, to illustrate characters flying in the air because yeah. he's always looking at these really interesting uh, angles. It was never yeah. boring, and it always gave you a depth. Like, you yeah. could understand this character, like, literally lives in the air. So I can yeah. imagine him on, like, a super babe would be... Oh, be amazing, yeah. Yeah, we, we always talked about that. I mean, there was a little period actually, like where McNevin and I, and um, and Hitch and I were sort of talking just informally about making a pitch. This was maybe 12, 13 years ago or something, you know, making a pitch to DC. You know, sort of coming off Old Man Logan and maybe sort of talking to DC about doing Superman. But but then sort of Hollywood stuff happened. You know, the Kick-Ass movie was coming out, and you know things just started sort of picking up, and I got distracted. But um, yeah, that's that's my dream. Like I, I I go into the business to do this stuff, so so I can't help thinking about it all the time. You know, I'm, I'm always quite jealous of my friends who are who are doing this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I know you worked for some publications back when people talked about comic books. You know, outside of uh, you know YouTube and stuff, and yeah. you do interviews and you would write about comic books, and you finally made it up there. So that's it's insane to you know think about where you came from and where you are now. When you think about the the amount of creators out there that have done seminal work at DC, seminal work at Marvel, and then seminal work on the indie scene, it's yeah. like uh, Warren Ellis, Frank Miller, Mark yeah. Miller. It's, it's actually quite a, a really small list of people that have done things literally everywhere that you can. Yeah, I guess you know, there's a really nice. I mean, Garth Ennis and everybody as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a, there's a few really interesting writers out there. You know, but like, um, but I think a lot of it is timing as well. You know, like if if I'd been born thirty years earlier or forty years earlier, this would never have happened. And Stan Lee said that to me. I remember having this big conversation with him, and he said, you know, around about two thousand and three, he said to me, uh, "Go out there and create your own stuff." You know, he said, 
Because if I had your opportunities, that was only talking about, he said, you can own your own things, you know, like he, he was work for hire. People kind of forget that, like Stan didn't own Marvel. And he just said, can you imagine what Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and I would do if we were around now, you know, if we were young guys starting out now? And it was mind blowing to me when I suddenly thought about it like that, like to really take advantage of the world that we are living in. Sorry, I'm just noticing myself getting darker and darker. If I can apologize to anybody listening to this, not only is my accent literally impossible for people, you know, but the light in here is so bad. Like all my Zoom calls at work are during the day. I had no idea how dark this room got at nighttime as the sun starts to go down. Yeah, you know, because I'm in the Philippines and here in Scotland, we've had to do some some um, some interesting planning. I'm sure the people are okay with it. I do want to talk about Superior because a lot of people, when they found out you're going to come on the channel, they said you need to speak to him about Superior, kind of a Superman analog, but also kind of a Shazam analog. It's, I believe it's a young kid. He's got a disability. Yeah. He offered the chance to become Superior, this character that he's kind of grown up uh, loving, and he finds out there's a bit of a Faustian deal associated yeah. with it. People love this version of the character. They they like what you did with it. Some dark undertones to it, but certainly a very hopeful story. What was your idea around Superior? Is that supposed to be a straight analog of, of Superman, or is it is it Superman with a twist? Um, I, I always like it when a secret... I love a secret identity. I always think it's pretty cool when there's somebody who's kind of powerless who becomes somebody so powerful. You know, like, that's the essence of good superhero stories, like Peter Parker, you know, there's a class dweeb, or Clark Kent pretending to be the office dweeb and everything, you know? And I kind of like the idea of somebody who wasn't having a good time getting a chance to be a superhero, and... Um, the idea actually came to me the day that Christopher Reeve died, and or the day after, because I went into the uh, what we call a news agent, you know, like a 7-Eleven type of thing in the States, where all the newspapers were all laid out, and there was photographs of Superman on every cover, and then there was a photograph of Reeve in his wheelchair beside them, you know? And it was actually, it was really sad, you know, like, because Reeve was my hero growing up, you know? But the idea just suddenly came to me, the idea of this guy who's in a chair, you know, also being this guy. And that's the crystallized for me then when I saw it. And I thought the idea of a, a superhero who had, um, you know, a disability of some kind, and I ended up going for multiple sclerosis because uh, I know a couple of people very well, you know, who, who have it uh, to varying degrees. Um, and I thought that would be quite interesting. And I like the idea as well of giving it a little twist and making it a little dark where this has been offered, you know, to this kid. Um, but the chance to get out of his wheelchair and become a superhero. But the dark twist is he's going back in the wheelchair unless he sells his soul after a week. And he's like, what? You know, so I like those kind of Faustian things, you know, the Christian dilemma and everything of it all. You know, it's a it's a demon, you know, that's that's offering them this pact. And I'd never seen that before. So I thought that was kind of interesting, you know. So, so I, I had a great time doing it and I got to do all my fun Superman stuff there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you end up having the I think the bully ends up becoming the super villain. Yeah. He, He's yeah. he tries to force him into being the super or the superior full time, but he finds a way around it because he's smart. Yes, no, it, it works. It works really, really well. I was happy with that book, and I got to work with Lanil Yu, um, also from the Philippines. You know, uh, who is just great. I mean, I rarely work with people twice because I'm so excited about working with the next person as well. You know, I've got a list of guys, a bucket list of people I want to work with, but there's some guys I love so much. You know, like Lanil or Frank Quietly or whatever. You know who who come back and we work together again. Um, and and, and Lanil's a sweetheart. He's great. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, he's one of the the more well known Filipino artists, Will Portacio. Is this something that you knew about, like the whole time that hey, if you want good artists, the Philippines has a place? Because, like I said earlier, comic books, American comic books, used to be so popular here. It's more manga now, but they had turned out so many great artists. It was just like artists, artists, artists. Uh, one after the other from here. Well, I, I spent a little bit of time in the Philippines about 10 years ago. I was doing a tour at the National Bookstore, who are fantastic guys. They they um, they flew me out and had me do a signing. And I was there for a week. And um, they uh, told me why there's so many great American comic book artists there. Like why so many great DC guys in particular seem to come from the Philippines, which I didn't know. And it was actually a drive to find guys out in that part of the world. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure who it was, if it was Sal Amendola or some, somebody who was working at DC back in the early 1970s. They, they literally went out and started looking at portfolios because there was a good comic book scene sort of out there anyway, a local comic book scene. And these guys all went international, you guys like um, Nesta Redondo, Tony De Zuniga, uh, Frank Chiarmonte and everything, you know, like really 
brilliant, brilliant artists who all came over and they were doing Justice League and Superman and all that kind of stuff, and quite a lot of horror comics as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't know this. I, I I assumed these guys were European. You know, I, I had no idea they were Filipino until I uh, until I went out there and it was explained. I could see that. Yeah, there's a, obviously there's a Spanish influence here because it was uh, you know it was a territory of Spain. It was kind of conquered yeah. by them for quite a while. But yeah, the kind of back in the day, you you never knew who who was writing or drawing your comic book. You saw a name, and you're like, oh, not really sure. Might be a man. Might be a woman. Well, yeah, it's funny. You would get like a crush on somebody who you thought was a woman, and then you find out it's a guy. You know, like I remember Julie Swartz. Julie Swartz was editing Superman. And I was like, I bet she's really hot. You know, <laughs> then it turns out to be a seventy-year-old man. You know, and Gil Kane, I thought was Jill Kane and everything. You know, so there was quite a few people I was quite disappointed. You know, I was like, Jill Kane, I bet she's gorgeous. Like she's a really great artist. You know, so. <laughs> so definitely a lot of people looking out for Superior. I do want to talk to you a little bit more about Brian Hitch. I remember when I was watching, um, I believe it's it's the second or the third Captain America movie, yeah. and we finally see the Ultimates Captain America uniform on it. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. They, they kind of changed up the uniform here and there. Obviously, that was created in the comic books with you. When he sends you that page and you finally see his rendering of what yeah. Captain America is going to look like in the Ultimates uh, you know, comic book, yeah. Do you know he's got it? Do you know that it's something special immediately? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to remember, I mean, that this was summer 2000. I, I started at Marvel, and I was doing Ultimate X-Men. It was the first thing that I got. And then when that was a success, they let me do the Ultimates. And they were pushing a lot of really great artists towards me. But I just knew it was Brian Hitch that I had to get. And I'd started writing at the first issue, and I could only see it as drawn by Hitch. And it seemed so awful to another artist if I was visualizing Hitch in my head and somebody else was going to be drawing it. It seems so disrespectful, you know? Um, but I, I said to Marvel, can you get him? Like, and, and he was embroiled in something else. He, did. he was under contract elsewhere. But Marvel were really amazing, and they actually got him out of that contract and got him because nobody else could have drawn the Ultimates. Everybody else would have made it look like a 90s superhero book. Brian was the one who gave it that realistic feel you know you, you're familiar with john buscema you know the, the marvel artist mm -hmm. john buscema. so john buscema's avengers i saw when i was about five and that's the way i visualized the avengers in my head so the, the the very casual realism that he brought i wanted something like that like to have captain america sitting having a coffee at a table like most superhero artists couldn't draw that kind of thing the way brian hitch can you know brian it looks like a guy sitting having a coffee you know and i, I just i needed somebody that had that level of realism um, and, and he delivered in spades. I remember the first sketches. He, he did character designs before he did any uh, any pages, obviously. And I remember the first ones coming in and being like, oh, my God. And we were actually up against it right away. We were always late with the deadlines. <laughs> but I remember they were really up against it in issue one. And he hadn't finalized the designs that he had in mind for the characters. So if you go back and look at it, a lot of them are drawn in silhouette because he hadn't mm. done the designs for the other guys yet, uh, but because it, it was needed for the previous catalog. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Brian, Brian lands the plane every time, you know, he knows what he's doing. It's crazy how much, uh, you know, Mark Miller there is in the MCU. If you go to like, uh, they incorporate a lot of stuff from the Ultimates into the Captain America story. Obviously you get the the uniform. Yeah. You, you, a lot of other elements, you know, incorporated in there, even in the Fox stuff where you had old man Logan end up being such a great movie there. Yeah. Is that one of the reasons that, you know, Stan Lee was like, you need to go out on your own and make your own stuff because you're just not going to be able to cash in on all the notoriety and all the money that's going to be generated off your ideas? Yeah. I mean, Stan, said, Stan and I had two conversations about this. And the, the first one he said to me was, like, you write kind of like a movie. And I, I'd never really thought about it because you just write like you write, don't you? You don't really think about it. <laughs> but he said, you you structure things like a, a movie. So it feels like you're doing half the work already, you know? And he told me, and other people said to me as well, you know, that the the Marvel, what well, later became Marvel Studios, but, the, you know, those guys were starting to look at it as a possibility around about 2003, 2004. The Ultimates being a sort of template, you know, for that first wave of the, um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And they were using Brian's designs. They were, you know, the Triskelly and all that kind of stuff and everything. Um, Nick Fury obviously being the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all that kind of stuff and the Avengers coming under the remit of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, you know, all, all these kind of things um, were starting to seep into the ideas of what they were doing as they were starting to plan out uh, some kind of a universe for themselves. Uh, and Stan said to me, look, it's awesome that you're, he didn't use the word awesome, but he said, uh, you know, it's great that you're doing these big books. He says, but in 10 years time, someone else will be doing these books. 
He said, you've got to go out there and create your own stuff. Um, and it really was, it was very wise, you know, because I remember the month I was talking to Stan, I, I had in the top five, I had the Ultimates, Ultimate X-Men, and Ultimate War Issue 1, and Ultimate War Issue 2. So I had four of the top five books that month. And I remember being quite pleased with myself, you know, and Stan said, that won't last. He says, you know, you have to go out and create your own stuff. This is really important. He said, now's the time to start thinking about it while you're a big shot at Marvel. Absolutely. And obviously Civil War ends up being, is that the last really, really big Marvel Comics crossover event? P perhaps. Obviously it turned out to be a great movie. And there's so many ideas that are end up mining there. Is that something that you try to pass on to newer creators is you need to think about your long-term uh, viability by thinking about what you own, you know, after the work is done. Because we're seeing so many deals out there, you know, you've got Substack, you got Netflix is in a deal with Dark Horse now, obviously you have Middle World. People are craving this content and they're finding yeah. out that there's a lot of stuff outside of DC and Marvel that really does translate to other mediums. Yeah, I mean, we've never been in a better time um, in terms of media for, for people wanting to, to make stuff. So, I mean, the, the amount of hours in the day now, you know, that, that television appears in. I mean, we've got all the crap reality shows and everything, but there's also a lot of scripted uh, shows now as well. And there's there's so many movies getting made, and especially our kind of movies, you know, like big genre movies. It's There's less of the Kramer versus Kramer, you know, or Pretty Women or that whatever. That mid-tier film is kind of obsolete now. It's either you know, yeah. low budget on Netflix or it's enormous budget and it can make it into a theater. Exactly, you know, and, and that's what we do. I mean, that's what comic books kind of is, you know. So so in, in that regard, it's great. What I do worry about, though, it's funny, and I've become very aware of it in the last few years, is oversaturation, though. It's got to the point where even I don't watch the superhero shows anymore. You know, like, I hardly watch any. Like, I, I think they're mostly junk, and I think it's because there's only a finite amount of really good people behind the camera. You know, so we're getting down to the C and D list characters, obviously, as well, you know, which is a, an issue, you know, you're, the, there's a big difference between something Stan Lee creates, you know, and something, you know, somebody else creates, you know, but like, uh, I, I think that there's a very finite amount of good directors and good writers and people who even 10 years ago would have been writers in a room are now running shows and everything, you know, just because there's a multiplication of these genre shows out there. So there's a huge number of fantasy sh shows coming. Uh, and there's a massive oversaturation of superhero shows just now, to the point where I don't think I really watch any of them. Now, I think I'm down to none, which is crazy. I mean, if you'd told me I'm watching Yellowstone just now, I've become obsessed with Yellowstone. Uh, I've just discovered it, really. And if you'd told me that I'm not watching a Marvel show or a DC show, but I'm watching a cowboy show, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you're mad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think another thing, it, it kind of translates over into comic books, too. I think... With the streaming format, instead of getting like episodic shows because you're it's kind of intended to binge a lot of mm. cases, I think you're just getting a really, really long movie. <laughs> it mm. might be like nine hours instead of yeah. t nine single episodes that lead up to a big moment. Kind of similar in comic books. You know, when you yeah. read, were writing those all ages Superman comics, yeah. those were one and done stories. Or if you did stories, maybe there would be two or three issues. Yeah. But now everything's kind of decompressed. And I feel like that's happening kind of because because of binging and it's kind of happening in comic books too yeah I, I think that's going to change as well you know I, everything moves in cycles you know and and you always have to remember that whenever comics is really starting to pick up and it does every 20 years there's a new influx of creators you know around about 2000 1980 1960 1940 you have a new influx of creators coming in but just before it it's the worst that's ever been you know and then suddenly <laughs> some new guys come in and it's great you know and and i think that's kind of where we are creatively a little bit um just now i think in in, in all media <clears throat> but but i think the cycle that i see changing soon is that i'm already seeing the 10 part shows becoming eight part shows mm -hmm. and even six part shows yep and soon we're going to be back you know with self-contained episodes which will be wonderful you know because there's only so many hours in a day and you, you know i don't want to you know spend 10 hours watching something that could have been done in two i say to everyone on my teams remember the godfather <laughs> one and two and three is less than your average uh show you know, like a season of a show is longer than Godfather 1, 2, and 3. And that was Michael Corleone's entire life. You know? <laughs> but it's not as long as the extended versions of Lord of the Rings. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually working um, on Christmas because yeah. I was kind of in charge, but I was in Korea. And I didn't have any family there. And the, the guy that was going to work nights, like his wife was there. And I was like, 
you go home and, and I'll come and work your shift for you. Yeah. And when um when I left, the guy that was was working, he's like, I'm gonna watch the Lord of the Rings extended trilogy. And when I got back, he wasn't done yet. And it was 12 <laughs> hours later. I was like, Wait, you, you still got 45 minutes. You got the third inning to get to. That's amazing. Do you know what? I've never rewatched them. I've never rewatched them. It felt like such a chunk of my life in the cinema that I thought I don't have that time again to watch these movies. Well, the the extended ones are like I think they're like four hours. Oh my! The last God. one's like four and a half. So there's there's another hour tacked on. I'm not sure how they did it, but uh, I, I love the Lord of the Rings. I'm not exactly excited for the Amazon stuff, but yeah, that was an interesting thing. I do need to talk about about this because Doc, uh, he's a friend of mine. He's the first person that ever said yes, Wes. I will come on your channel and, and yeah. talk comic books. And I think today, probably why we've been talking, we hit twenty thousand subscribers. So I definitely appreciate Doc. His favorite superhero team is the Authority. Right. Now, obviously, you came on to the Authority. I believe you worked with, uh, was it Hitch, right? Uh, no. Warren Ellis uh, and Brian Hitch did the first 12, and then Frank Whiteley and I took over. Yes. And then Art Adams, I think, actually came on the end, right? Uh, at the very end, there was one issue with Art. But um, I that was my big break, actually. And I, I can actually remember the exact month it came out because it was such a big deal for me. March 2000. Like, I remember... I'd been treading water for like 10 years, you know, I'd been doing stuff. I'd always kind of kept my head above the water, but like it was kind of difficult. I was writing submissions, pitches, uh, at least as much as I was writing stuff I was getting paid for. And then my life changed completely with the authority. Like the authority came out and it was the only thing that seemed to be going up in sales. Like everything else at the time was really going down. And it was amazing. It really, it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. It had its troubles, you know, because the company, um, the parent company, DC, that owned Wildstorm, they'd taken over. It was not the kind of book they wanted to be doing. You know, it was pretty radical for its time. So it was a headache, but it was a nice headache. You know? Yeah, I guess Warren Ellis, who you um, replaced, I guess he was a big supporter of yours, and he was like, this is a Mark Miller book. But, yeah, DC, I, it, they were interfering. Let's just put it that way. They were censoring a lot of things that were supposed to be on there. It was also bad timing because we did have the, the September 11th, I think, tragedy happened right in there. They didn't want to put certain aspects, I guess, in the book. I think the problems predated that like quite a bit, you know, like I remember at the time every day there was just like a phone call and, you know, but to be, to be, to be fair to Wildstorm though, they were actually great. Like John Lehman and Scott Dunbar, um, they really protected us from a lot of the heat that was coming down from DC. And it's weird because I can see it from both points of view as well, because they are publishing the book. It's they, they own it, you know, so they can choose what the content's going to be and they can fire me. But, um, but it was my first hit, so I was also really protective of it. I was on a real roll with it. People really cared about it and everything. But but what, what was good was it became so difficult that Marvel suddenly seemed really attractive. So Joe Quesada had just been made boss at Marvel at the time, and Joe phoned me up, and he, his exact words were, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. Come and join us, right? And and I was like, yeah, it does sound pretty attractive, you know. So I, I was on my way back from L.A., stopped in New York, and Joe signed Frank Quitely and I over to Marvel at that time. Yeah, it's an exciting time for Marvel. I know by the end, um, the Joe Quesada era, may, people might not have loved it because of some of the Superman or Spider-Man stuff. But there for a while, he really kind of revolutionized Marvel and who could actually be a Marvel creator. Like yeah. Beforehand, you wouldn't have had some of the artists um, and writers that would be able to come in and work on Marvel. But he was definitely more experimental in bringing in you know, more indie-style creators to come in and work on the characters. It was an amazing time. I, I think... That Marvel's had three really amazing periods. Like for me, I would say the Stan and Jack and Steve era of the 60s, the Jim Shooter era, you know, as problematic as it was, the creativity was astounding, you know. And I didn't get to, I couldn't afford to buy it at the time because I was buying DC stuff. I didn't have the money to buy Marvel too, but I, I was aware of it and how good it was. And I went back and got some of it. And then I'd say the other one is Joe's time. You know, the, the, the really great editors in chief are Shooter. Stan and Joe, you know, and Joe's up there with those other two. Like, I mean, that period from summer 2000, you know, sort of Christmas 2000, running through to about 2009, I think Marvel was on fire. Like, there was a good dozen books I was reading, you know, like, and I know other ones were good, but there was like 10, 12 that I was loving, like really loving. So it was, it was a really great run. You know, there was, <clears throat> there was a lot of great artists as well coming in at the time who we hadn't seen the likes of McNevin, Coy PL, all those guys and everything all coming through to Marvel, which was great. And it was a really good environment for writers. Marvel's big problem in the 90s, especially 
as they began to shrink as a company mid nineties, is there was a lot of editorial control where people would come in and rewrite your stuff. And it was a real issue among writers that my friends who were working there at the time were going crazy because, you know, guys who weren't very good were coming in and completely rewriting the story. And Joe's big promise was, I'm not going to touch your stuff. And he never, they never changed the comma in one of my stories, which was <laughs> so liberating. It was great. Well, it sounds like that's actually one of the issues nowadays. I've actually heard that from quite a few writers is, uh, Something we republished, it, it, I'll make I make videos, you know, sometimes pointing out the the faults in comic books, and I'll yeah. hear from them like, I did not write that. That was not supposed yeah. to be in the comic book. They actually went and changed it without consulting me, um, which as a writer I think I would lose my mind. Oh, uh, especially if you've done something good, you know, like before my career took off. I would have little bubble ups of kind of things that people were kind of interested in, you know, but never quite made it, you know, that people maybe liked, but it didn't lead to anything. And I remember one of them was an issue of Justice League, um, issue 27. And I wrote the script in three days, which for me is really fast. And that's always a sign that it's really good for me. You know, it's, it's, it's gone well, it's gone quite well. And I remember handing the script in and I can't remember I said something that the editor kind of took the wrong way. Like I contradicted him or something like that. And, the, there was weird power plays just to happen at DC. It was really odd. And I was a young guy. I was only in my 20s. And the guy said to me, uh, the more I look at your script, I don't think it's as good as I thought it was earlier. He said, I'm going to do some rewriting on this. And it was like a punishment for contradicting him, you know? And I was like, oh, my God, you know? And about three months later, you get a proof sent through before it goes off to the printer. So the comic came back, and every panel description was exactly as I wanted it to be, you know? But the dialogue on every single balloon, every single piece of dialogue, everything was different. Everything for the whole 20 <laughs> pages. And I phoned up and I remember I had no money at the time, so it was really expensive. I was phoning from Scotland to New York and I was on the phone for three hours to this guy and I was talking him round on every page, taking it back to the original script and saying why I had, he'd ruined it and I, this is what we had to do. And I remember I managed to get all bad, I think two pages back to where it was. I managed to get the other 22 pages back <laughs> to where it was and it got re-lettered and it was okay. And it was horrible though, a three hour phone call. And then about, you know, a year later, two years later, it won an award in the UK. And I remember the editor saying to people, oh, you should have seen how bad it was before I got my hands on it. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was, it was a really, it was a weird time. Like, editors were like maniacs back then, you know, like they, I think because the image guys and guys like Frank Miller and all that were so powerful in the late eighties and the early nineties, the editors were really cowed, you know? So then whenever they got the upper hand a little bit, like when the industry started to shrink in the nineties, there was some crazy power play going on and a lot of rewrite. Yeah. That, uh, it's crazy. He didn't know he was, he was, uh, he was rewriting in a, a comic book hall of favor at the time. He hadn't made it yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mark, I do want to say thank you very much. You, know, you had this big news nightclub coming out, one ninety nine price point, absolutely insane. Pepe the Raz. We've got a Jorge Jimenez coming board, coming on board with uh, Miller World. Miller World. Is there anything else that you needed to say out there or get the word out? Do we have any big more more big announcements coming? Um, yeah, there's actually tons of big big announcements coming because I think we've stockpiled things for a little while. You know, like, this has been a good week. Like Steel and Marvel's biggest guy, DC's biggest guy launching a new book at 199 i think okay we've had a good week this is this is interesting you know uh, but i think um the next month we've got the first uh, stuff about american jesus the tv show on netflix starting to come out the first season is called the chosen one that's been filmed in mexico just now it's in the final week or two of filming right now um so you'll start to see some stuff about that starting to come out uh, towards the end of next month. Um, we have, what else is happening? Obviously right now at the moment, we've got the third volume of Magic Order, which we're doing as a show as well. Um, and uh, Prodigy, the Echidus Society is out just now with Matteo Bufagni, who is fantastic. All the best artists right now are Spanish or Italian, right? They're absolutely brilliant, these guys. Um, towards the end of the year, we've got uh, December, October's, uh, Oh, yes, October, we've also got the final volume of American Jesus, the third part of the trilogy. I started writing it 18 years ago, and this is the big final conclusion. That will be season three of the television show. And then December, Nightclub launching at 199. January, we've got Pe uh, Jorge on uh, Nemesis. And then March, a huge surprise coming, you know, absolutely huge. Frank Quitely, Travis Charest, um, Olivier Coipel, Carol Kershaw, 
whole bunch of brilliant artists we have big 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 projects that have been putting together for two and a half years because all these guys are slow so i wanted to give them enough time to get everything in the can before i solicited but my god this one i mean the next year is really interesting you know we've got nemesis with Pe uh, with uh, Jorge, we've got pepe doing the big crossover event this is the book nobody knows about with the biggest artists practically of all time in it so so it's really exciting i, I mean i can't wait for people to read all this I'm going to say this isn't going to be Space Bandits Volume 2, but are we going to get that too? Yes, absolutely. After oh, the Because uh, Space Bandits are in the crossover. They're, they're in the big crossover. And then yeah. from there, we're moving on to – there'll be the return of quite a few characters after that, actually. You know, there's going to be um, the final Magic Order. Uh, there's the uh, Sharky versus Space Bandits and all that. There's tons of stuff. Chrononauts 3, you know. So, like, yeah. I mean, I'm wrapping up a lot of these things. Most of them are trilogies. Very nice. I, I didn't expect to like Space Bandits. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I ended up reading it. I was like, oh, this is my kind of comic book. I like sci-fi. I like oh, a nice. little adventure. It's pretty funny. It's, it was great fun, right? And again, working with with, with Matteo, you know, I mean, the guy's a genius. and the, I knew he was good, but sometimes you don't appreciate someone. You know, they say you don't know somebody until you live with them. And it's the same with uh, artists. You know, you work with them, you realize what they bring to your stuff. The guy's a genius. Right? My kid. Who's sick? Just turn on the TV. Hold on. <laughs> oh, <don't worry. laughs> is it is it just a little bug? Is it anything? No, no. He's he's got a tablet and he can sling whatever he's watching on the tablet to my TV down here. Ah, right. And he's sick, so he normally wouldn't be up at four thirty in the morning when we're recording this. <laughs> but he's been coughing and waking up at odd times, so obviously he's he's watching the tablet. Sorry about that. that no unexpected. My my two youngest are next door right now watching uh, watching Teen Titans. And it's it, DC do animation so well. They absolutely love Teen Titans. I've, all girls, I've got all girls. Uh, but we went to see tonight Legion of Super Pets or the League of Super Pets, uh, the movie. And the kids were, I've never seen them enjoy a movie as much as this movie. Like they absolutely loved it. So I'd recommend it. Like I know that the, like, like your, your, your viewers are like big DC fans and everything. A lot of them, you know, go and see this movie. It's like, it's the way you want DC to be up on the big screen. It's just really fun. It's great. So they got Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and all the characters and their pets all right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so charming. There's lots of little Easter eggs and everything in there for, you know, people like us that could spot, like, uh, you know, like Carol Danvers' airline company and things like that. You know, just these little things in the background and loads of cool sort of Daily Planet stuff and everything. Um, but it's just a, it's like a really well put together Pixar movie. I think Pixar's been kind of rubbish for the last five, ten years. You know, I haven't enjoyed much of Pixar. And other people are doing it better now, I think. And I think, like, uh, what was that great one I saw? The Bad Guys? Did you catch The Bad Guys? I haven't seen that one, no. Uh, oh, you haven't been in the cinema, of course, because of lockdown. But, like, uh, check it out on uh, if you can get it on Prime or something. You know, it's really great. And there's a lot of really great animated stuff just now that isn't super expensive that's in that 70 million kind of mark. And Legion of Super Pets is an absolute treat. You've got Keanu Reeves as Batman as well, which is I didn't know until I watched the movie. It was great. I didn't realize that either because I know The Rock, I think, is Superman's dog, Crypto, and then Kevin Hart was Batman's dog, right? Yes, that's right. And one of my kids said to me, I wonder if in the movies they're going to point out if Superman, when he hears Black Adam speak, that Black Adam sounds exactly like Superman's dog, <laughs> you know? And it's a fair <laughs> point. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the movie. It's, uh, you know, there hasn't been a lot of great movies. We didn't have the COVID shutdown. A lot, a lot of stuff came yeah. out. So I'm glad good stuff's coming out. We're going to get to go to the movies in November because we're going to finally take a family trip. It's been almost three years. Wow. And, uh, wow. We're pretty excited about that one. Mark, I do want to say thank you very much. It's almost, uh, you know, a stealth 20,000 subscribers special. I didn't know I was going to get here today. Obviously, that wasn't part of the plan. But I really appreciate it. <laughs> coming on here talking about comic books talking about the big announcements you know in your career and stuff like that it's like a it's a pretty big moment for me i really appreciate well, it a total, a total pleasure and I, I love the fact you do this as well you know like i mean there's something weird just now you know the like comic news sites and everything have been eaten up with so much movie stuff and tv stuff and everything there's hardly anything about comics anymore isn't there you know and I, I love the fact that you know you guys are out there doing these podcasts and the total passion i think is brilliant you know so long may it continue we mentioned King of Spies during the video. And if you haven't read this, I made a best comic books of 2022 so far. And shockingly, King of Spies from Mark Miller and Mateo Scalera is very near the top. The good thing is it's actually finished. The other uh, couple of comic books that might be ahead of it 
aren't quite finished yet. This has a real good shot being the best comic of the year. Definitely check this out for some great comic books.